Grand Jure in Paris, and this is the museum that was built around Monet's life-size water lilies. So Monet painted these massive water lilies that are the size of that whole back wall over there, and they basically built a museum around them. And this is what it looks like. It's curved, and you're just immersed in water lilies on both sides. It's got a white roof, white light. It's really pretty cool, and I mean, these are these are life-size uh, water lilies. So if you like Monet, it's great. If you don't, just close your eyes and, and go to sleep. But you can see that there's various different paintings all along here, and, and there are several different rooms shaped in circles. You can go and, and look at the various different uh, paintings that are there. And this just shows you have to go to wide angle to get it all in. And so it's actually it's actually pretty nice when you do that. Okay, and right out right outside of that, of course, is the is the gate leading to IMP's pyramid, leading to the Louvre, or as they'd say here in Utah, the Louvre. So that there's the Louvre where you get to see all them good paintings there. And there's the pyramid that, that IMP built later. So it's kind of interesting to see a modernistic glass pyramid, you know, in a 200-year-old classic museum. But this is where you line up to get in. They actually, you go in underground now right here, and they've got some, some really beautiful fountains there. So, orbit. All right, so we talked about orbit a little bit last night. Now, you can't really talk about orbit without realizing what makes up the orbit. One of the things that we always like to, um, you know, go over here is the bones of the orbit. And so, how many bones are there in the, in the orbit, Rachel? Seven. Seven. Let's start. Name one. Frontal bone. All right, hang on. Axillary bone. You're student. I'm Cole. I'm the new intern. Oh, you're Cole. You're the intern. Oh, I thought you didn't start till next month. But all right. Well, you at the VA? Yep. All right. Well, welcome. Well, you get a reprieve for one lecture, but next week read on tumors. Okay. Sphenoid. Sphenoid. All right. That's three. Ethmoid. Ethmoid. Four. Lacrimal. Five. Palatine. Palatine six. No, no, we'll get, you get, I, I don't, I won't pick visitors. Oh, Zygomatic. Zygomatic, good, all right. So people often forget the little palatine bone. That's really one that people do forget about. But the other thing that you've got to realize is what's around the orbit. And so again, when you're looking at the orbit here medially, but also inferiorly and superiorly, there are sinuses around the orbit. So any diseases, any infections, any inflammations, any tumors that affect the sinuses can affect the orbit. And of course, we talked a lot last night at Orbit Conference about the orbital apex, a very busy layer where nerves and things go out of the eye, nerves and vessels go into the orbit. And so, very, very busy area here. And then of course, behind that, you've got um, you know, a lot of busy anatomy back here. So the key thing when you wanna think about the orbit, there's not a whole lot that goes on in the orbit except for the fact that the orbit houses the globe, which is the most important you know, thing that we think about with the eye. All right, this just shows a little bit in a sagittal section. Now, uh, Ariana, how do we subdivide the orbit? What are the, the main areas that we break the orbit into? Uh, there's intraconal, extraconal. And, and what's the third potential space? So periosteal. So if you look at the, the extraocular muscles, the muscles in the intramuscular septae make a cone. And so basically the base of the cone is at the apex of the orbit and then it forms as the muscles go onto the posterior part of the globe. So this is intraconal. Extraconal is the area outside of the muscles in the intramuscular septum, which is not a whole lot going on in there. Some fat and, and you know a few little vessels and nerves and things and then the periosteum lines the bones of the orbit and there's a potential subperiosteal space where you can have again infectious you know processes coming from the orbits hemorrhages things like that are coming from the sinuses i mean and things like that that can form this potential subperiosteal space and this shows that <coughs> In an MRI scan, the most important thing in the intracoronal space is obviously the optic nerve and the vessels and nerves that go through here, and then the extracoronal space, and then the subperiosteum, 
is a potential space. All right, what are we looking at right here, Allie? Neuroid glands, particular eccrine glands that connect to the voidal. All right, so we've got these eccrine glands. They're forming this little acinar pattern. Why would I be showing you these in an orbital lecture? It's all lacrimal glands. Lacrimal glands, good. So you're not, my, my mind would have been stimulated had you not done that. I would have been crying up here. But so the lacrimal glands, remember, they're an eccrine gland. They've got this acinar pattern where they form this circular pattern and they do their secretions into the central part of the lumen right here. You'll see that they'll often have this little kind of eosinophilic staining granules in them. Now, what else is, is goes on here besides just the glandular part of the lacrimal glands? Brad? What, else? what other cells are in there? Um, there's fat. Well, not many fat cells in the lacrimal gland. What other cells are there besides oh, the Oh, you're talking about inside the lacrimal gland. Uh, like um, mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal cells. And what are those usually comprised of? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, little myoepithelial cells. So little cells that kind of surround these acini, these little spindly shaped cells. And I like to think of them in simplistic terms. So my simplistic way of thinking about them is these are the little cells that squeeze the glands so that the secretions can get out. That's way too simplistic. But remember, not only are the lacrimal glands made up of, of the epithelial cells that make the secretions, but also the myoepithelial cells that surround them. So those are both in the lacrimal glands. There's another type of cells that, that kind of live in the lacrimal glands. Sneha, what other cells live in there? Sean. Uh, not really. I mean, those are just modified myopathic cells. Anybody? People forget this all the time. Lymphocytes live in there. So wherever you have mucous membrane exposed to world, you'll often get some little gatherings of lymphocytes, almost like Peyer's patches that you have in the gut. So not uncommon in the lacrimal glands. You have these little almost Peyer's patches, groupings of lymphocytes, and they are mostly more T lymphocytes than they are B lymphocytes. All right, we're looking at, um, back to, now. There's an external photograph of um, someone who has these little yellowish, You know, that's the hardest thing about orbit. Orbit is the one part of the eye we can't see. And so oftentimes when we're looking at the orbit, we almost have to infer something going on. And so before we jump in and order an MRI scan, we want to look for subtle findings now. Um, the one thing nice about it is orbits, there's two of them. And so we can often compare. Do we see anything very subtle that we can compare to? Boy, this is really subtle. This is hard when you're looking at orbits because if you look at it, look at that little light reflex where that is in the pupil. And you look at the light reflex here just a little bit higher. And it's very subtle, but you don't quite see the wrinkles as much here as you see here. And so you almost get an idea that there's a vague fullness there and that that eye may be pushed down a little bit. And we look at the scan here, the CT scan. What do we see in here? There is an enlargement of a, of a mass um, in the area of the lacrimal gland on the right side. Exactly. And people would call this a coin lesion. By coin, it means it's kind of rounded and it's pushing the eye in and down and it's got a little bit of a border around it. So what would you be concerned about here? All right, so you'd be concerned about either an inflammation, an infection, or a lacrimal gland tumor per se. And we look at the path, and this is what it looks like. What are we seeing here? So there's lots of little blue cells all around. Um, and then there are, the, there are some what still look like, um, like 
like glandular function with these uh, about bilayer or multi-layer multi cells that have uh, secreted the eosinophilic substance. Exactly. So you see that this is almost like glandular. Some of them are more tubes than small glands, but it's glandular. But then there's all these kind of little spindly cells proliferating with this ground substance in between. What do you think this lesion would be? A pleomorphic adenoma. Exactly. Pleomorphic adenoma. The other, the other word they call this is sometimes they call it a benign mix. So it's a pleomorphic adenoma. And this is the most common um, you know, tumor derived from the lacrimal you know, gland tissue itself. It's a pleomorphic adenoma, or we call it a benign mix. And so it's a mixture of this proliferation of the, the little glandular epithelial cells themselves and then the little cells that surround it. So that's the name benign mix. Here's a close up. You've got this proliferation of these glandular cells. Sometimes they'll form round, almost look like lacrimal glands. Sometimes they'll be these little elongated, almost tubes. So they form these little tubes of the lacrimal, lacrimal glands. Oh boy, that's a bad one. Let's see if we've got a better one. It's weird, it shows up really nice on mine and, and not, so, not so well here. All right, and I know it's hard, Ariana, but this is a person, they, they had a um, pleomorphic adenoma, benign mixed tumor, they removed it, patient came back, you know, six months later, swelling, lesion in that area, and they did this. Yeah, sheets of blue cells with some cystic spaces or some blood vessels um, with the recurrence is more concerning for like a malignant process. So I'm looking, I could imagine that some of these cells are human. Boy, I'm sorry that doesn't show, show up. Like, <laughs> if you guys came and looked up here, it shows up really nice up here. Well, you can certainly see there's nucleoli, there's clump chromatin. It's still attempting to form glands, but look at that. Look how active these cells are. So what does this tumor become now? And so what we call this, if the other one was a benign mix, we call this a malignant mix. So much less common. But the key thing, when you see an initial pleomorphic adenoma or benign mix tumor, those often have a pseudocapsule around them. They grow slowly they kind of push out and have a pseudo capsule so if you can get the whole thing out this is where you want to do a complete excisional biopsy then you can cure it but if you leave some inside there you can't get it all out then they can come back and when they come back they can be more aggressive so it can go from a benign mix to a malignant mix so that's what you worry about so you want to make sure once you you know once you convince these are tumors remove the whole thing all right, Allie, what do we see in here? External photograph for the left eye, very proptotic. So it looks like maybe some hypoglobus as well. So to get the idea, something's here, one. it's pushing that eye down. Again, what area is that in? Lacrimal gland. Lacrimal gland. And we look at the scan here, and you can see that it is it's still attempting to be round, but you know, you kind of lose the tail here. You don't quite have as good of borders there. And this is the pathology. What do we see in here? In the center, there's lots of like a collection of cysts, um, it's a connective tissue, and then there's also bone on this capsule. Yeah, this is actually even going into bone a little bit. There's a little bone there, and it's kind of invading in. What would your concern be here? Exactly. Now, adenoid <coughs> cystic carcinoma is much more aggressive than, than the pleomorphic adenoma. And adenoid cystic can actually invade bone. It can metastasize. Now, this is one of those cells, one of those types of, of tumors where people use the term disarmingly benign, meaning you look at these, they look benign. There's not nuclei all over the place. There's not mitotic figures all over the place. You look at them and say, this is pretty benign looking, but it's not. So this is really, really, it's hiding. It's, it's a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, if you will. So it looks disarmingly benign, but it's really not. And there are various different ways this tumor can present pathologically. All 
All right, so Brad, what, what, what is this? What growth pattern is this? Well, that's really not what they call it. What do they call it? Basaloid pattern. That is one of the patterns. Is this a basaloid pattern? I, I thought so. I guess not. All right, so this looks kind of like Swiss cheese. And so this is what we call a cribber form or Swiss cheese pattern to it. So you see it's got these little spaces in it, and it's got the tumor cells around it. So this is called the cribber form or Swiss cheese, these little spaces all through here. And so this is fortunately the most common form of, of the adenoid cystic carcinoma. There you see a close up, these little Swiss cheese spaces in between with the cells around them. And again, don't look really benign. All right, what pattern is this now? This is the basaloid. And so you see it almost looks like a basal cell carcinoma, it's really cellular. You kind of lose the glandular pattern to it and it becomes really cellular. Why is this important? Um, it's more aggressive. Exactly, these are the, the nasty variant. And so when I said that you can get some really aggressive tumors that can actually invade into the bone, they can invade you know, out of the orbit, they can metastasize distantly. It's usually the basaloid ones that are the ones who do it. So if you see this basaloid pattern on this, you know, adenoid cystic carcinoma, these are the really bad actors. So these are the ones that you don't want because they, this is the basaloid pattern. These are the bad ones. So if you see that pattern, beware. These are the really bad ones. All right, what are we seeing right here, Sean? So what would your differential here be? Uh, again, some sort of tumor progressing around the eye, um, maybe inflammatory or infectious. Okay. So we look at it. Now, if you look at this, it's a little bit different. So this is what we call almost a pancake lesion. So instead of that specific coin or round shape lesion, this one, it's almost like silly putty. And it goes around the globe and goes around the structures. And if you look, not only is there some over here, but maybe there's even a little bit some over there. When you look at the pathology, what do we see in here? We see uh, very sheets of new cells. Um, you don't really see much of a pattern, just kind of a lymphoid proliferation. All right, so a big lymphoid proliferation, and we do a immunoperoxidase stain, and it stains like this. That's one of the <clears throat> that there's lymphocytes. So don't forget, you can get lymphoma, the lacrimal gland also, but you can also get dacryoadenitis with lymphocytes in there, so you can get inflammatory lesions. And so back in the olden days when I was a resident, they used to have what's called the 50-50 rule. And they said, okay, 50% of all lacrimal lesions are epithelial derived, and 50% of those are you know, benign mixed pleomorphic adenomas. Well, it turned out that that's really not correct. And when the Shields and uh, Wills looked at all of their lacrimal lesions that they biopsied, turns out almost 80% of them were lymphoid derived somehow. Either lymphomas or dacryoadenitis or lymphoid hyperplasia. So really, in reality, about 80% of the lesions of the lacrimal gland are, are you know, lymphoid derived, not necessarily lymphoma, but lymphoid derived, and only 20% are epithelial derived. But of those 20%, half are still benign mixed. And then of course the rest are the others we talked about. So. Half of the 50-50 rule still takes hold. So remember, when you see a swelling in the lacrimal area, chances are it's going to be more lymphoid than it is an epithelial-derived tumor. All right, what are we seeing right here, Mike? The colloidal folds. Colloidal folds. So what do you worry about when you see colloidal folds? Um, you can think about a mass pushing it back. <laughs> All right, so those are the two things. We used to be taught, again, that this meant that there's an intraconal mass. So you'd worry there's an optic nerve tumor or another tumor that can occur in there. But when you really looked at them again, it turns out short eyes with a flat 
posterior sclera can give you choroidal folds too, and those turn out to be even more common than intracoronal tumors. But let's say, for example, that you looked at this and you said, wow, this is a concern. Maybe there is an intracoronal tumor here. So you worry about it, and you do a scan and you see this lesion. What are we seeing here? Here's the path. What are we seeing here? So you got uh, what it kind of says what it is. It's sort of blood, uh, almost like caverns, uh, in blood. Thus the name, cavernous hemangioma. And so for some reason, these tend to occur intraconally. That's the place they usually occur. The symptoms are vague. <laughs> People will complain of just some vague soreness, maybe some funny you know, washing out of vision on occasion, and then you look at them, and when you do the, the um, scan, they'll be well circumscribed. So again, these are ones that they grow really slowly, and they tend to slowly push out. So they don't have a, a real capsule per se, but it's a pseudo capsule. So they push on the connective tissue, which kind of gets condensed. And so these really do have a pseudo capsule around them. So when you go to remove these, these really do just shell out. You just pop these out. And they've got these large so-called cavernous spaces with the fiber septae in between. Catherine, this is a little higher power picture. What does this tell me about this lesion? Why am I showing you this picture? Um, there are a lot of red blood cells. Yeah, a lot of red blood cells. In the, in the spaces. Okay. Um, and that would tell you that it's low flow. The fact that there's red blood cells tells you there's low flow? What tells you there's low flow? <coughs> if you look right here in each of these spaces, here's the red blood cells down here. Here's the serum up here. And so the red blood cells have settled down to the bottom. The serum has settled up to the top. So when you get separation like that, it tells you that there's stasis. And so it tells you that these are low flow. And so the nice thing about these, when you take these out, they don't bleed like crazy. You know, when you have a capillary hemangioma, they're usually more in the lid than the orbit, but boy, those things, they bleed like crazy. But these have stasis in there because the red blood cells have settled down. So look, this guy's hematocrit is, is 60, so they're a blood doper, you know? So they really got a lot of... Man, it's too early in the morning. You guys just... That's humor, or, 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 all right, so. Lance Armstrong. Yeah. All right, we're looking at a guy here, Rachel. Um, Again, one of those things, what's the, you know, what's the side that's affected? I don't know. <laughs> These are so hard. That's what Boopy always does this to you guys. He says, you got to use your brains, not run to a scan. And so, again, it's very subtle, but there are some changes here. Look at the fold there, as opposed to the fold here, and look at the space between the lower lid and the limbus there, and the lower lid and the limbus here. You kind of get the idea, and look how it's fuller there, that maybe there's something behind there pushing that right eye out. Very subtle, but again, it's a little bit more prominent here, and <clears throat> if you were to do a hertel, this eye would be more proptotic. But this time it's not down or in, it's out. So as if there's something behind it growing. And then we look at the scan and we see this. What the heck is this thing? Um, so this is, I don't remember how you can see it. There's like this fibrous material all over the place. Um, and then there are these little like staghorn spaces. Exactly. So you see these kind of long vascular channels, but you see a lot of smaller vascular channels here. And these are called staghorn, you know, like a, like a deer, you know, so the deer horn sticking out. So staghorn spaces, lots of blood vessels. And then we look at a close-up. Some of these have this funny irregular shape to them, but not only are these all these plump endothelial cells proliferating, but look at all the cells in between that are proliferating. What do we call this lesion? Exactly. So this is not a hemangiome, it's hemangio 
pericytoma. So it's a proliferation not only of the endothelial cells, but also of the pericytes surrounding them. And so you can see in the pretty active, look at the little nucleoli in there. So this is a hemangio pericytoma. What's a, and this is a close-up here. You see these little staghorn spaces, but you can see there's a whole bunch of just little tiny vascular spaces all around them with proliferation of the pericytes in addition to the endothelial cells. Now, what's a special stain we can do that can help us tell for sure that's what this tumor is? Reticulum stain. Oh, sorry. Close-up showing you how they can be. Now, the other thing that's interesting about these is they can be kind of benign, intermediate, or more malignant looking. But just when you memorize that, you say, okay, we're gonna look at this, we're gonna see how it behaves. <coughs> it's not necessarily correlated with how these behave. And so these are one of those ones that's really tricky. You can get some that don't look that bad on the path and they come back <coughs> aggressively. Others look pretty aggressive on the path and they don't do much. And so it doesn't really correlate. But Sometimes you can see where you remove these, they come back, they come back a little bit more aggressive looking. And so we try to categorize them, but it may not mean anything. And so this is one that is more malignant looking. You can see how it's got these nucleoli in here, the cells are growing more, got clump chromatin all over. So it can go from a more benign to an intermediate to more malignant appearance with the hemangiopericytoma. And again, the stain that you said is reticulum stain. Why? Why does that stain? Well, it stains the reticular network around the little capillary channels, which is really what the pericytes make. And so if you do a reticulum stain, you can see that it's got this little net, these little tiny nets all over the place here. And so this tells you that it's making this reticular network around the cells, and so it's really helpful to do a reticulum stain. What do we see in here, Allie? You see a more heterogeneous mass, probably intraconal. Intraconal, but heterogeneous. Yeah, it's like the globe. What would you be concerned about when you see something that's it's heterogeneous? There's some air, there's almost some fluid levels in here. It's really kind of a mixture of what's going on there. Like tumor or like lymphoid, lymphoid tumor or something like along those lines. All right, so let's give you, uh, I'll give you a little bit of history. This patient is 10, 10 years old. Does that help any? All right, so, you know, when you see this heterogeneous, especially in a child, you want to start thinking more toward lymphangioma rather than hemangiomas. That's kind of a misnomer. It's not really just lymphoid channels proliferating, but when you look at these, you'll see these large, almost like large lymphoid spaces. They have kind of this incomplete, spindly, flattened endothelial lining around them, a lot of connective tissue, and then again, you get almost these little pyres patches of lymphocytes seen around these lesions. The reason that that's important is these are interesting. Sometimes when these kids will get an upper respiratory infection, these lesions will grow, which is weird. So they'll get more proptosis. Chris, what's happened here? Another reason why you can get rapid <laughs> increase in, ah, God, I did it. I called you Chris for a year. I'm sorry, Brad. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to. I knew I was going to get not get through the day without saying that once. So. All right, sorry, Brad. Sorry, Brad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you were just too nice to correct me when I called you Chris for like six months. So. Brad, what what is that that we're showing you here that could also cause a rapid increase in proptosis? Um, well, so you could get bleeding into these spaces, which is, looks like it has occurred here. Exactly, so for sometimes these will have all these little vessels in between and one of them can bleed and so you'll get blood into these channels and you can get a pretty rapid increase in proptosis. And so sometimes as the blood sits there for a long time, red blood cells degenerate, they turn almost brown and so they call these chocolate cysts. And so if it's really bad proptosis that's threatening the vision, 
Uh, people will often go in with either an ultrasound guide or a <coughs> CT guide, put a needle into some of the big cysts and drain them. Then you get this chocolate, goopy stuff come out of it, so it's broken down red blood cells. So you don't necessarily have to do emergency surgery on these, but if you get this rapid proptosis from this acute hemorrhage, then they're a problem you need to treat them. Here you can see again blood in these spaces and then here you've got these um, almost like Peyer's patch lymphocytes and these will grow when the kids get an upper respiratory infection. So again, that can cause increased proptosis. As the, as the plastics guys will tell you, the orbital guys, these are really tough to remove because they're not encapsulated. They send little fingers all over the place. And so if you go in there and try to remove these, and you take out what you can, you can't take them all out, and oftentimes they'll just grow back just as bad. So these are really difficult to treat. So even though they're, they're a benign tumor, they can cause you know, significant issues with the child. If they keep growing and you're getting proptosis, you can actually affect the vision with these. Here's a close-up of those Peyer's patches lymphocytes. So this is the lymphangioma. Now, some people will are, are splitters, some are lumpers, and I happen to be a splitter, and so my brain works like an OCD brain, and so I like to have 100 mailboxes, like, you know, upstairs, and each little thing goes into a slot, but some people like to split them up, and so we'll split these up, and we'll split them up among AV malformations and venous malformations, and we'll split them into different categories. Other people will lump them together and say, you know what, this is all one thing. It's all just kind of this pseudovascular anomalies. And so, you know, any kind of varices, AV malformations, lymphangiomas, they're all the variations of the same thing. And so in the old meetings we had where you'd have the orbit guys and the path guys, they would argue for, you know, hours on this. And there was, you know, letters of the editor would go back and forth for years. And so still there's kind of two camps. You know, the camp in, in England really likes to lump them all together and the camp over here and in Canada likes to split them all up. And so I'm a splitter, so I like to split them up. But just realize some people think it's all a big continuum of lesions. All right, what are we seeing here? Sneha. Right, and what do you make of the age of the patient? Yeah, it's a child. So what do you worry about when you've got, this is rapid onset, rapid onset of proptosis like this in a kid. All right, so rhabdo is the one you really worry about. This is her scan. And look at this huge tumor. Whoops, let's go back. So look at this huge tumor right here sticking. Now, really, 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 really big, difficult tumor here. So this was a kid that, that when I was a, a just starting here and um, had this, you know, rapid onset, they did a biopsy. They said, this is a rhabdo. Um, we need to give you chemotherapy. We need to do surgery on here. And the mom and dad were going through a bitter divorce. Mom checked the kid out of the hospital and took her to Mexico where she had laetrile treatment. So. You guys are too young to remember Laetrile. That was the magic cure at that time. And, you know, that the mean old medical establishment who likes to suppress new treatments in the U.S. wouldn't, wouldn't consider it. And so people would go to these clinics in Mexico and they'd pay a fortune. They'd give them Laetrile, which is derived from the <coughs> almond pits or something, wherever they came from. But in any event, it didn't work. And so they'd give them steroids and they'd give them this magic laetrile. Of course it would start to shrink when they gave them the steroids. And so in any event, dad hired a private detective, found out where mom had taken the kid, went to Mexico, re-kidnapped the kid, brought her back. By the time she came back, the tumor was twice this big. And they had to do an exoneration and they had to do radiation. It was really horrible. And so these are tumors that are treatable, but you have to treat them with the right stuff. And that's the key thing. All right, so of course we've got this, this we made this up for um, Orbit Conference once, and so it's got the nice things, but tell me, what's the most common variety here, Sean, of these tumors? Uh, everybody gets embryonal. All right, so embryonal is the most common, and when you look at the embryonal, they'll have kind of round to oval cells. Some of them look like little tadpoles. They've got little tails on them. 
And so this is fortunately the one that is the least aggressive, and, and it is the most common. It's still aggressive, but, but there are some that are even more aggressive. So the embryonal and embryonal type, and when you look at them, again, they've got these big fat nuclei, and they've got these, these little tails that sometimes come out of them. And what do we look for in these? Mike? Exactly, some striations, because as the name implies, what are these derived from? Muscle. So, and it's not mature skeletal muscle, it's kind of, you know, embryonal muscle cells. So when you look at these, you can often see cross striations in these tadpole-like cells when you look at the, the rhabdo. And, and you can see, you can do what kind of stain? It shows these real well. Oh, trichrome. Yeah, trichrome is amazing. So, trichrome will stain the cross striations. So this is a trichrome stain. And look at those little tiger stripes. Like the little tiger's tail here. You can see the cross striations from the muscle in, in a nice embryonal. So, that's the most common type. And that's beautiful. You see kind of the tiger stripes there. So, fortunately, I mean, these are still aggressive tumors, but again, they're the least bad. And fortunately, the most common is the embryonal type. And you can do some special stains, and obviously you want to do the stains that are stains that stain for muscle-derived cells. So uh, Desmond, Bimentin, Actin, muscle-specific antigen, any stains with immunoperoxidase stains that stain muscle-derived tissue will stain these tumors brown. And so the immunoperoxidase stain will stain them brown. All right, Catherine, what pattern is this? Well, sacs with tumor cells in them. Um, so you could think of like alveolar. So exactly. So this is the alveolar type. So if you, if you think about it, you know, pathologists spend a lot of time, usually path labs are in the basement, they're poorly ventilated, sniffing a lot of formalin. And so, you know, they, we, they get pretty, you know, imaginative. And so this does kind of look like the alveoli in the lung. And so this particular growth pattern looks like kind of alveolar spaces in the lung with tumor cells in them. Why is this important? Uh, because alveolar is the most aggressive of the other types. Exactly. So of the types that you get, this tends to be really aggressive and nasty. So this is the one that you don't want to have is the alveolar type of the rhabdomyosarcoma. And again, this just shows you this happens to be a muscle-specific actin stain. And so... It does the immunoproxy stain, but look at these cells. Look at the little nucleoli in them. Look at that. It's got like three, four nucleoli in it. Clumped chromatin, so really aggressive, nasty looking cells, and they behave that way. What do we see in here, Rachel? you be concerned about here? Um, well, what we'll tell you, we're just, we're not obviously talking about that right now. Um, but you could get, you, you can get, um, like, inflammation and infection with rhabdo. You, you can. That, that's really not, I mean, always want to keep rhabdo in the back of your minds. But again, hoof beats, you know, you think horses, not zebras. And so, you know, most common thing when you're seeing a youngster with this unilateral swelling, they may have history of a fever, maybe some upper respiratory symptoms you think about. Exactly. Cellulitis first, infectious or inflammatory. So what we used to call pseudotumor, now we call it idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome. But so you want to think infectious, you don't want to miss the cellulitis, especially, now this looks pretty anterior, you want to do a scan, but if, you have, if you've got a cellulitis anterior to the septae, that's not quite as bad as posterior to the septae or true orbital cellulitis. So you want to worry about infection, you want to worry about inflammation. And so this particular one, when they do a biopsy here, what do we see in here? Of 
lymphocytes here. So this turned out not to be a cellulitis, but this turned out to be an oral inflammatory pseudotumor, what we used to call it. So more inflammatory. And here's a close up. You see there's the lymphocytes here. They're mostly lymphocytes. And um, when you look at them, they can be a mixture, but, but a lot of predominant B lymphocytes. And then you've got, of course, the vesicomal cells and the little fibroblast proliferating around it. Here again, you can see it's very, it's very diffusely infiltrating at this point. Now, sometimes what can happen is, let's say you've had a person who's had orbital inflammatory syndrome, and you treat them, and eventually it settles down. <coughs> Ariana, what's going on here? I see a lot of fibroblast looking cells. Yeah, in fact, even literally fibrous tissue here. What do we call this? Yeah, so the word we, all, we used is sclerotic at this point. So people used to call this a sclerotic pseudotumor. So sometimes when you get an orbital inflammatory syndrome, even when you treat them, as it settles down, you can sometimes get this fibro, fibro, fibrous proliferation, not really vascular, more fibrous proliferation. And the reason why these are difficult is these can sock in an orbit. And so in the days before we had cortical steroids, people would go blind from these because they'd get this mass you know, in there and they just get this whole frozen globe in there with this fibrous tissue around them. So this is called a, a sclerosing pseudotumor, we used to call it. So sometimes once the inflammation calms down, you can actually get even a sclerosing pattern to it. All right, um, Allie, what are we looking at here? A dude, I love the mustache. A dude, man. Left eye looks like actually got some hyperglobus. Um, look, at the, look at the, where the reflex of the light is. Fullness of the globus there. Exactly, some diffuse the fullness there. And you look at the scan, and again, kind of this diffuse, not really heterogeneous, kind of a diffuse lesion there. And here are the cells. Fetal lymphocytes. What would you be concerned about here? Lymphoma. lymphoma. So um, realize when you're looking at these lesions, there's a <laughs> continuum. So there's lymphoma here, and there is the there is the you know orbital inflammatory syndrome pseudotumor here. <coughs> In between, there's what's called an atypical lymphoid hyperplasia, and they're not just this and this. There's kind of a continuum in between, and so you want to look at things. So when you look at Lymphoma versus, you know, inflammatory lesions. First of all, um, Allie, in lymphoma, what kind of cells do you usually see? B, B what? B lymphocytes. Yeah. All right, so you see lymphocytes. And when you do immunoperoxidase stains, they tend to mostly be B, and they tend to be monoclonal. So lymphoma, they tend to be monoclonal, B lymphocytes. Chris! Sorry, <laughs> Brad. Um, in the inflammatory lesions, what kind of cells can you see? So in inflammatory lesions, you get more of a variety of inflammatory cells. So you could get like uh, macrophages, you can get B lymphocytes, you could get neutrophils, you get germinal centers. Well, well. Less, less neutrophils, but certainly you can get plasma cells, lymphocytes, you know, maybe some epithelial type cells. You get germinal centers, whereas in a lymphoma, it's a sheet. Whereas in the inflammatory ones, you can get germinal centers, you can get a mixture of cells. And if you do immunoperoxidase stains, they are polyclonal, they're not monoclonal. And so you want to try to see which end of the spectrum it's on when you're looking at these. And this particular one, it's got a sheet of lymphocytes, no um, plasma cells in there, no follicles. And indeed, you do the immunoperoxidase stain, it turned out these were all um, B cell kappa tend to be monoclonal, and that's, that's the end where you get the lymphoma. All right, gosh, this is a really ugly specimen. What kind of surgery did this patient have here? Snap. Um, Blue. 
So this patient, somewhere buried in there, is actually a globe. So this is an exenteration. So they remove the whole orbital content. So when we think of, of the orbit, I mean, the orbit can be a repository of cells from somewhere else. And so we worry about there can be metastatic tumors that go from elsewhere in the body to the orbit, or there could be tumors that can arise around the orbit that can go into the orbit. So you can have superficial malignancies from the lids, from the conge conveyed into the orbit. You can have malignancies from the sinuses that can invade into the orbit secondarily. So what is, what's the color here on this particular lesion? What are you worried about here? Yeah, so kind of dark, almost black here throughout the orbit. What would you wor be worried about here? Exactly. So this could have been a superficial melanoma of the lid or of the conge that then secondarily invaded the orbit. And when you look at it at higher power, this did indeed turn out to be a malignant melanoma. Now, you can also have other the said malignancy is either metastatic or, or locally invasive. So again, the, the orbit, it's pretty rare that you have you know, primary malignant tumors of the orbit itself, but, but it is, again, a place where you get secondary tumors. And here you can see these are these big melanocytes, big, ugly-looking melanocytes. So this was a superficial melanoma. I can't remember if this was from lid or conge, but then secondarily invaded into the orbit. So big, nasty, malignant-looking cells. All right, this is what Sean looks like when you say it's your turn. Okay, Sean, what is this? <laughs> what do we see in here? Medial hyperoptosis, um, the superior and inferior scleral show, uh, yeah, really prostatic, and then we also see some injection temporarily in nasal. What would you be concerned here? Yeah, so you can see whenever you have that surprise look, you always got to think thyroid because the lids retract, the eyes get proptotic, you can see sclera above and below, and you see this injection here on, in front of where the muscles insert medially and temporally. So this is classic for thyroid ophthalmopathy. And you look at the scan, you can see here are the muscles right here. Mike, what's the <coughs> difference between a myositis and a thyroid muscle when you do a scan? Thyroid muscle has the muscle body thickening, but the tendon is usually uh, spared. Exactly. So here the tendon is spared, but the inflammation is in the body of the muscle. Now, looking at this CT scan, would this be worrisome at all? The apex looks crowded. Yeah, look at those fat muscle bodies here all the way to the apex. And one of the things you worry about if you've got a really crowded, you know, fat inflamed muscles is they can start putting pressure on the optic nerve at the apex, you can even get ischemia from these. And so this would be particularly worrisome in this case. And this is just, uh, this is an autopsy eye, just showing you, look at this muscle here, tendon spared, big, fat, juicy muscle here in thyroid. So when you look at the thyroid, they'll often have this lymphocytic proliferation. They'll have a lot of edema. It'll be kind of a myxoid inflammation, edema early, but late, just like some of the inflammatory pseudotumors of the orbit, you can then get scarring. So initially you'll have edema, but then later on, if you can't calm it quickly enough, you can actually get scarring, and then those muscles will scar down, people will get diplopia, they won't get good movement of the muscles. All right, what are we looking at here, Catherine? What the heck is this thing? Yeah, it could be um, how circumscribed maybe sort of lesion. Yeah, now what, what looks weird there is we're shining a bright light over here. Mm -hmm. and it's shadowed a little bit there, but you see a lot of almost, you know, illumination inside that. What would you be concerned about here? Some sort of cystic lesion. All right, so this is a young child. Like a, a dermoid. All right, so you'd worry about a dermoid cyst. Now remember, we talked about those conch lesions. There's different, we use the term dermoid really randomly. This is what we really call dermoid. This is a dermoid cyst. So the orbit superiorly where the you know, bone fissures sometimes are. And so what you see when you look at this is it's filled with, what is all this stuff in the middle here? Uh, it looks like keratin. 
keratin. And so when you cut these, they're really disgusting. I don't know if we had a dermoid cyst yet. You guys have been here this year. They're really pretty disgusting. They're filled with this smelly keratin stuff. It's really yucky. And when we look at the lining, what are these lined by? Uh, it looks like stratified squamous. All right, so it's a stratified squamous epithelium that lines these, and they make keratin here. What do you also have to see to call it a dermoid as opposed to just an epidermoid or dermal, you know, inclusion cyst? Uh, dermis or... Uh, well, like dermis half right. <laughs> what lives in the dermis? Um, oh, uh, it looks like there's some hair follicles. Exactly. So yeah. what the term we use is dermal appendages. So not only do you have the epithelium in a dermoid cyst, but you have hair and sebaceous glands. And so that's important. So you, don't, you know, don't just have the epithelium, you have the epithelium with these dermal appendages here. So that's a true dermoid cyst. And there's a close-up. There's a hair follicle, there's the shaft, there's the sebaceous glands, and there's the epithelium with the keratin in them. So when you remove these, you gotta be really careful because if you remove them whole, the kids do really well. But if they break, that keratin spills in there. Keratin can really induce nasty inflammation. So you get this granulomatous, you get these giant cells. It's really a difficult to control inflammation if these cysts break. So these are, again, something you want to try to get out whole. And there we say goodbye to the loo with the fountains and the pond and the... That's the side pyramid. That's, that's over one of the subway stations that's there. So next week will be tumors. And so not only is it tumors, but when we talk about childhood tumors, we talk about differential diagnosis of leukocoria, white pupil. So know that for next week. And interns, now your, your, your day of uh, reckoning is coming. So read, read up on the tumors, okay? All right, any questions in one minute? Nope, all right, great. Thank you. Thank you. you bet.